sharing today about what the gospel is and what it is not. And there's a reason why I made this uh, presentation for you today. I got an email from a man in Colorado Springs who's been all over that town trying to find a church that preaches the gospel and hasn't been able to do so and suggested that part of the problem is that they don't realize that what they're preaching isn't the gospel. They, they think, actually literally think it is. And he says, do you have one message that deals with these issues that I could just have to give to people? And I thought, well, I, I said I preach the gospel every Sunday, but I don't think I've ever in one explained what it isn't as well as what it is. So today I'm going to do that. Last week I was dealing with some important gospel issues, but today I'm going to trace for you, starting with Charles Finney in mid 19th century, how we've gotten into the condition that we're in today in the evangelical church, and I'm going to propose a very simple solution to the problem, and that, of course, is going to be gospel preaching according to the pattern of the New Testament, clarifying essential gospel issues. I'm going to be just a short version today. I'm not going to be spending as much time as I normally do on all the gospel issues like justification, the blood atonement, the wrath of God. I'll mention these things, but I'm going to spend more time dealing with some of the historical developments than, so that we can get this in front of people so they can understand what some of us are trying to say and why we feel it's so very, very important. Paul summarized his gospel in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which you also received, and which you also stand, by which you are saved. If you hold fast the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Now this may sound very simple, but it's of utmost consequence. And I'm not going to unpack all of that, but there is more in there than it meets the eye when you just look at it. For instance, Christ, what does that mean? Not a lot of people don't realize that Christ means the anointed one, which means the Messiah, which means that he's the one that was promised by all the Old Testament prophets, and he's the promised Jewish Messiah who came into the world. That he died for sins. That's very significant. It implies that he lived a sinless life, which we're taught elsewhere in Scripture, and that he provided substitutionary atonement for our sins, that the wrath of God that should have come upon us, that we deserved, fell upon Christ, and he bore that wrath for us so that those believe would, be escape, would escape from the wrath of God. He was buried. That means he really died. He really had a physical body that died and went into the grave. And he was really bodily raised on the third day before witnesses. These things are essential. Every single sermon in the book of Acts, every time the gospel is presented anywhere in the book of Acts, the, the resurrection of Jesus is mentioned. And if we neglect preaching on the resurrection and the bodily resurrection, we neglect what God has ordained that people must believe in order to be saved. We can't just use the word Jesus and assume everybody knows what that means. They don't. People know that Jesus was some sort of a religious person who died, but they don't know who he is, what he did, and why they need him. So that's included. Giving that as a brief introduction to the essentials of the gospel, I want to talk about how we got into a condition where one rarely hears the gospel in the modern evangelical church. The roots of this problem began with Charles Finney. And I'm not the only one saying that. I've been saying that for many years, but uh, when we were, um, when we've talked to uh, John MacArthur, and when he's written books, and he's been on Todd Friel's show, if anybody asks him where the problem began, MacArthur says it began with Finney. And I'm going to say to you that when we accepted Finney and his teachings in America as bona fide evangelicalism, we got off course so badly that we've been off course for 150 years since. And it causes us to be able to accept things today that normally Christians in, in centuries past would never have accepted if somebody tried to preach that to them. Now look at what Finney says. These things, I hope they shock you. If what Finney says doesn't shock you, then you've been influenced way too much by pop evangelical theology. Here's what he says. A revival is not a miracle according to another definition of the term miracle, something above the powers of nature. There is nothing in religion beyond the ordinary powers of nature. 
It consists entirely in the right exercise of the powers of nature. Now, no one that I know of who's ever been accepted as a theologian or somebody who's a great religious leader in evangelicalism has a more crass, man-centered uh, theology than Finney. And he didn't believe that the supernatural work of God through grace was what we needed. We simply needed to harness the powers that we already have in nature. Now you should be asking yourself, how did this guy ever go down in the annals of American history as one of our greatest evangelists? This is not biblical. It's radically unbiblical. Let's see some more. I, as I said, I hope it shocks you. This is from Lectures on Revival. It is just that and nothing else. A revival is not a miracle, nor dependent on a miracle in any sense. It is purely a purely philosophical result of the right use of the constituted means, as much so as any other effect produced by the application of means. Now, he's not talking about means of grace like some of us talk about. He's talking about means to excite sinners, and I'm going to show you what he means by means as we go forward to some more slides. More from Finney, Lectures on Revival. There must be excitement sufficient to wake up the dormant moral powers and to roll back the tide of degradation and sin, men being so reluctant to obey God will not act until they are excited. Now, let me explain his theology. He believed that he did not believe in the fall. He didn't believe that we have the sin nature of Adam in the sense that uh, other theologies have taught. He believed that man retained his moral abilities even after the fall. And that these dormant moral powers were in every person aside from any special work of grace. And so the evangelist was the person who somehow pushed the right buttons, used the right words, created the right mood, excited, somehow stirred up that dormant moral power in man through rhetoric or through his new measures, he called it, which is where the altar call came from, and then thereby exciting people into action. Now, why would he say that? Well, let's look some further into Finney's theology. This is from his systematic theology. That which demands a natural impossibility is not and cannot be moral law. The true definition of law excludes the supposition that it can, under any circumstances, demand an absolute impossibility. Such a demand could not be in accordance with the nature and relations of moral agents, and therefore practicability means the ability to do it, must always be an attribute of moral law. To talk of inability to obey moral law is to talk nonsense. Now, I'm going to unpack that a little bit. Very important. This was his axiom. He called it a first principle. And, it, and Charles Finney would not allow anything in the Bible to contradict this because he says if you, if you don't have this, you can't understand moral law. What he says is this. God will not command us to do anything that we don't already have the ability to do. That's what he's saying. God would never command an impossibility. So therefore, if Jesus says, be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect, then you can be perfect. And he started teaching perfectionism toward the end of his career. And rather than believing that the moral law of God in the Bible, like the Ten Commandments and all the other laws, are there to show us that we're sinful and to drive us to, the, to a Savior, to the Gospel, the moral law is there to be fully obeyed now by the powers that we already have. And so therefore, God doesn't need to do a miracle to save people. You already have the ability to obey God, whatever it is he says. Now, most this, he was basically fully rejecting the theology that went before him in America. He preached during the second great awakening. The first great awakening was the total polar opposite of this. Edwards and Whitfield and other uh, people of the First Great Awakening believed that sinners were hopelessly lost in their sin and that God had to supernaturally rescue them through the gospel. Finney, though, was different, and part of it was his own person. He was a great musician. He was a great athlete. He was handsome. He was articulate. He was athletic. Everything he did, he succeeded at, and if he put his mind to do it, he could do anything. And so he, fit, he brought that idea into religion. Man's ability is the fountain of all religion. 
Now, we would, I would say, absolutely, we are not unable to obey God's moral law. Look at, the, look at what Jesus said in order to shake up the self-righteous Pharisees. You have heard, thou shalt not murder. I say that if you even hate your brother, you're guilty. If you say, thou fool. Uh, if you have lust in your heart. These things are to show us that we're sinful and we're needy. And we need the gospel. But no, Finney says we can do it. We can do it all. So keep that in mind. Now I'm going to give a summary of this, and I, I don't want to spend more time on Finney, but I wanted you to know what's happened to us. People want to know what's happening today. Why are some of our great leaders so uh, ill-versed in the gospel or not proclaiming it? Well, we, we sowed the seeds in America 150 years ago when we allowed Finney to set the stage and determine the future practices of the evangelical movement. And if somebody as heretical as Finney can be a great hero in America, then why not some of the people we've got out there today? There's our problem. We don't have much of a standard. Now, this theology would be considered heretical by everybody's standards, but it still got in. Now, what happened as a consequence of Finney's beliefs and teachings? The first is what was called New Measures Evangelism. The New Measures, and they don't seem very... Um, profound to us today, but they were a radical departure from the earlier practices of, at least in America, of the revival preachers or gospel preachers. Before, people like Edwards, for example, would read his sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, with as little emotion as possible. And people would cry out for mercy because they felt the weight of their sin and the hopelessness of their lost condition. But it was dependent on God convicting the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment through the Holy Spirit. I'll show you that before. But his new measures were based on the idea that Finney, if he had a big lecture hall full of people, what he saw out there were people that all as they were, are, without any special work of grace, are able to be excited into being capable of keeping God's moral law. And he actually said that if we would get to work, we'll have the millennium in America within eight years. He believed you could create a millennium. So the consequences, new measures of evangelism. He had an anxious bench. He, has, he was the first one to have people come forward and uh, sit at a certain bench if they were anxious about, uh, or probably means they got excited, got excited by his ability to do that. And that was the invention of what became the altar call. He created, or I shouldn't say he created this, he was a major figure in 19th century America in the creation of the benevolent empire. During the 19th century, people believed in the perfectibility of human nature. And there were uh, societies, dozens and actually hundreds of them, created in America to stomp out every possible ill in society. And the belief was that we can Christianize America, we can bring in the millennium, we can get rid of sin, and even if there are sinners, they'll be forced to obey God's moral law whether they want to or not. This is the precursor to dominion theology and reconstructionism and other things like this. We're going to, we don't need God to come in judgment. We don't need a rapture or any of these kind of things. We just need to fix America and fix the world. So the benevolent, benevolent <laughs> you know, I'm very articulate, especially when I'm doing an important message. The benevolent empire... Post-millennialism, that means that the church is going to rule for a thousand years, creating a golden age on the earth, and Jesus won't come back until we fixed the problems on planet earth. Doesn't that give you a warm feeling in your heart? I believe that's going to happen. Well, you know what, I've got to tell you something. What happened? This was 19th century, which was a century of optimism and romanticism. The 20th century basically dashed this up until the like, 1980s. We had World War I. Then we had liberalism that came in and modernism into the church. Then we had the Great Depression. Then we had World War II. And then we had Korea. Then we had Viet Vietnam. And by the end of the, by the 70s, there weren't very many people standing up and selling books believing post-millennialism or dominion theology. But in the 80s, it started coming back with the word of faith and the um, reconstructions and other dominionists. It seems like if we look like things might get better, then all of a sudden we don't need the rapture anymore. Well, I'm telling you, we need it. Got here this morning, and the roof was leaking over here again. We've been battling this roof, and it leaked again. And I was thinking, Lord, 
either sell this place or let's have the rapture. <laughs> I want to move either up or sideways. But <laughs> but I, I guess there's nothing wrong with preaching the gospel with a re leaky rope, is there? As long as it's the gospel. Perfectionism. The believing in the perfectibility of man and human nature and that Christians could be sinlessly perfect. This has been taught now and again in church history, but it always ends up uh, not working out, and it didn't in Finney's day. And what I, and this is, wasn't something that Finney said, but it's something I think that happens in America. We believe that success is more important than doctrine. And when I've been debating, because of being in, getting in the public arena uh, uh, with these articles I write and been on the radio and been doing some debates, what I get back from people that don't agree with me is they say, well, how can you argue against success? This guy that you say is a false teacher has 20,000 people in his church. This other guy you say is false has 30,000 in his church. And look at all that they're doing. So how can you say it's wrong? Well, that thinking comes right out of what happened with Finney. He was successful, so basically gave him a free ride for teaching false doctrine. Nobody cared. As long as the multitudes pulled in, poured into the lecture hall, who cares if this is heretical? By the way, Finney's teachings are even considered heretical by Roman Catholic standards because he was a full Pelagian and the first three canons on justification in the Council of Trent condemn Pelagianism. So even Finney wouldn't even be close enough to the gospel to satisfy Rome. So if that's the case, why would evangelicals in America accept him? Well, they still do, and I got nasty letters when I wrote my article saying, if you think there's something wrong with Finney, take me off your list. Well, let's move on here. Let's just suppose for a moment Finney is wrong. Let's suppose that humans don't have the innate dormant ability to perfectly obey God if they just get excited by the right means. Let's suppose instead that we are descendants of Adam, that we're sinners by nature, that there's nothing in us inclined to love God and serve God and go to, come to him on his own terms because we're not seeking God, and that we're lost and hopelessly depraved. That doesn't mean that we're just as sinful as we possibly can be, but it means that the whole person is lost. Some have described it this way. A lot of theology suggests that really what you have is, a, is an island of righteousness in a sea of sin. And that within humans, there's, there's some divine spark or some island of righteousness, and if you could just reach that thing, that will somehow uh, cause them to respond. But I believe that what causes people to respond is the grace of God working through the Holy Spirit who convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And that the means isn't some technique, some emotional draw to excite people, but the gospel itself. So if we didn't believe Finney, what would we do? Well, we'd preach the gospel in its native offense, knowing that all sinners will reject it anyway unless God does a work of grace. It doesn't bother me to know that I'm going to get rejected when I go out on the street preaching the gospel. Why? Because God said that that would happen. But not everybody will. In some cases, that veil of darkness that blinds their minds will be pulled away by God's grace, and they will see the light of the gospel shine into their hearts, and they will rejoice, <laughs> and they will uh, become new creatures in Christ. They will be converted, and they will hunger for the word of God. It says, as newborn babes in Christ, desire ye the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. Every newborn Christian comes with a hunger for the word. Absolutely. That's something that I don't have to create in them. That's something that the Holy Spirit creates in them. And all I have to do is give them the word and they will rejoice. They're like little birds in a nest. We, used, we had these little chickadees that built, uh, Gordy Williams had built a little uh, birdhouse, a little hole in a license plate that hangs out, kind of decorative. We had it on our porch. Well, chickadees made a nest in there one year. And that little birdhouse filled so much with little chickadees and the mama, they would come with worms all day long. That whole birdhouse was hopping like that. <laughs> We'd sit out on the porch and they'd get used to us. Diane would be in the porch and then the chickadee didn't want to feed the babies. And she said, this is my porch, so they'll get used to me. 
And they did, and that birdhouse would hop. Well, they're, they're hungry. It's like they eat insatiably. A newborn babe in Christ is like that. I was like that. I couldn't wait to get to church. I went back again and again wanted the word of God. See, what we got wrong is that we think we're trying to work with a person only in their sinfulness, and then we got to do all these things to get them to come to church. we got to give them a message that they like. We've got to entertain them. We've got to cajole them. We've got to create programs where they have to be here. And, and then even at that, it's hard to get them to come. But if, you, if people are converted by the grace of God, they become newborn babes that hunger and thirst for the word of God. And all you have to do to get them to come is feed them. Novel idea. <laughs> Provide the means of grace. That's what I'm talking about. Means of grace, we've talked about that many times here. The word of God, the communion, baptism, fellowship around these means, and prayer. Now, some people don't believe prayer uh, should be there, but we teach that here. Pray for the Lord to send laborers into the harvest. If we believe that people are totally lost out there, rather than me figuring out some way to excite these dormant moral powers that I don't believe exist, I would pray to God that he would raise up gospel preachers, gospel workers, and, uh, and congregations to go out with the word of God and to send forth laborers into the harvest. Because God is going to use his means to, to have bring in a harvest. We don't have to be... Um, spiritual technocrats that know how to um, excite people into action. We just need to be faithful to God and let him sovereignly save who he's going to save. If we don't believe Finney, we'd pray for the return of Christ. See, the Dominionists think that we're escapists and losers. They'd say, well, you don't have any optimism that the world is going to get straightened out. Uh, no. <clears throat> well, you just don't want to get to work and to fix all the problems in the world. No, I want to get to work to preach the gospel because God's coming and he's going to judge us and we better escape. And so the Lord's Prayer I see is a prayer for the return of Christ. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. They see something that we can do now. That's why we disagree. This affected permanent changes in evangelicalism. I want to say to you, I don't want anybody to get me wrong. The people that came out after Finney mostly were not nearly as extreme as him. Very few were as heretical as him, but they kept his methods. His methods determined the next 150 years of evangelical practice. And they never went away. After Finney, the next great evangelist was Moody. And I want to say something right now before I go any further. God used people that are less than perfect and many people got saved all right and moody was a christian i don't know where finney was at because i don't know how how he could believe what he did but moody was a christian sunday was a christian billy graham's a christian and god used those people and many people were saved but we need to sit back and reevaluate where these methods came from and where our terminology came from is it and is it truly biblical I will assert to you that just because God can use something, which he can, doesn't mean that we shouldn't be doing it as he has revealed in the scripture. So Moody began his ministry preaching about the wrath of God against sin and hellfire and the need uh, to escape that through the blood of Jesus. But he met an English preacher who convinced him that was not the best method and it wasn't very appealing, and that he should rather preach on the love of God. So Moody, for the rest of his career, preached on the love of God in John 3, 16, because more people would come. Now, it's valid to preach on the love of God, but it's also valid to preach on the wrath of God. And I don't think you can see one without the other. If you see that you're a sinner that was rescued from wrath by God's great sacrifice of sending Jesus to die for your sins, then you know the love of God. But if you don't think there was ever a problem to be rescued from, and somebody just says, well, God's a very loving God, then you may just get some idea about what that is. It's not totally biblical. All of these people, Moody Sunday, the healing revivals of Billy Graham, used the altar call as a means to excite people into action, and that was invented by <clears throat> Finney. Now let me say something right here, because I know people are going to have questions. Am I saying that people that go forward at altar calls aren't saved? No. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that some people that go forward for altar calls aren't saved, and some are. Let me tell you how you'd know the difference. 
If you were, I'm sorry. Think about it this way. Let's say you are the one sitting at the crusade. And there's 50,000 people, and there's a great preacher, and he does preach the gospel. And as you're sitting there in your seat, the preaching of this gospel penetrates into your heart. And as you sit there, you realize these are the words of truth. And you know that Jesus is real. And you know that he died for your sins. And you know that he was raised from the dead. And you know that you better get, do something because you're lost and you're going to go to hell if you don't repent. And you're sitting there and you realize that because the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And then when the evangelist said, well, come forward, you, you, you'll get out of your seat in a second. You'll be out, out of there before the plants get going. You know, the ushers that aren't really going, that they put in there. And you can't wait to get down there. Why? I'll tell you why. Because you were saved while you sat in that seat. Yeah, going forward didn't save you. Believing the gospel did. But, but being saved motivated you to be willing to go forward because they told you that's what to do. And that's your public confession. That's okay. That's fine. But let's imagine another scenario. Let's say you're sitting in your seat and there's a very eloquent sounding evangelist that can really spin a wonderful message and maybe it does have the truths of the gospel but you don't really get these truths of the gospel or know what he's talking about. But in your mind it just seems like, well, people would be better off if they were religion or maybe they should turn over a new leaf and try to make a new start. And so just thinking that way and not being sure about anything, you're sitting in your seat and then they start playing the soft music and people start getting up and they start going down and you're thinking, you know what, maybe if I go down there something, maybe this is a good thing to do and it seems kind of attractive because all these other people are doing it and you just walk down there and you sign a little card. Did you get saved? Not necessarily, probably not. Okay? And so you have a mixture. Now, that's not to say that somebody had bad motives that was doing the meeting, but this was just what became of our evangelicalism. Now, MacArthur talks about this quite a bit in his books. Now, a lot of people end up thinking they're saved by raising their hand, signing a card, um, taking a pledge. Americans will take a pledge. I'm going to turn over a new leaf. I'm going to be a better person. Uh, some, some places now, they just have a little card. I want to be a Christian. Or I believe in Jesus. All right, you're saved. Not necessarily. A conversion is going from darkness to light, from the bondage of sin to the power of God over sin. And it's the light of Jesus Christ shining into our hearts and totally transforming us. And if you are converted, you'll pray a prayer, you'll sign a card, you'll go forward, you'll do anything else they tell you to do, as long as you get the word of God in the end. Because you're hungry. But if you're not converted and you do all these things and you think you're a Christian, you might be fooling yourself. But one way or another, everyone kept some version of this and rejected or neglected the doctrine of human inability. And that's the Achilles heel. And I'm going to make a strong claim. If we believe in human ability, then we can't understand the gospel. We think that somehow there's something that we can do to add to whatever God may have done that will cause us to be saved. But when we know that we're hopelessly, helplessly abiding under God's wrath and that only God could ever rescue us, that's good. Because he will, as we put our faith in him. The Bible does teach human inability, so I'm going to reject what Finney taught. Look at what it says in the Bible. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are not foolishness to him. He cannot understand them because they're spiritually appraised. Until the Holy Spirit turns on the light, it just doesn't make sense. And many people are very honest about it, and that's good that they are. I've had people tell me, well, why would God kill his own son? Can't can he do something better than that? It just doesn't make sense unless the Holy Spirit convicts you. Because the mindset on the flesh is hostile to God, Romans 8, 7 and 8. The mind of, notice this. Where is this island of righteousness in the sea of sin? Where is this dormant moral power? Where is this thing in man that somehow a religious teacher could appeal to because it's already there and it already wants to serve God? Now what Paul says, the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God. It does not subject itself to the law of God, unlike what Finney said, and is not even able to do so. How clear does it have to be? 
Finney says you can obey every moral law, otherwise God wouldn't have given it. And I say, no, the moral law is there to show you you're a sinner. He asks him to give guidance about what's right and wrong, but nothing good is going to happen until after God awakes you from the dead. The Bible says that we were dead in trespasses and sin. We don't just need a little a boost, a little self-esteem boost, a little motivation to be good people. We need to be made alive from the dead. By faith you are saved, by grace, not of works. Can God use unusual means? Yes. I want to quickly just hope you, hope you know these issues and these events. Let me quickly tell you something. Remember the story of Philip, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch? And the Ethiopian eunuch was out in the wilderness and he had a, somehow had a copy of Isaiah 53 and he was reading it. What does this mean? What does this mean? Who is this one who suffered? And God took Philip and brought him out to this Ethiopian eunuch. Now that's unusual means. All right? But what happened when he got there? He explained Christ and the resurrection. The, the Ethiopian eunuch believed the gospel and was baptized. Now what about Peter? He saw a vision uh, coming down of these unclean animals, and then an angel talked to him. And in the meantime, Cornelius was elsewhere, and angels talked to him. And between the angels and the vision, God managed to get Peter to go preach to these Gentiles. But what happened when he got there? He preached the gospel. And God granted repentance to the Gentiles, as it says. Now, God may do unusual things to get our attention. He did in my case when I was converted. I have a very unusual story. God can do miracles. God can get you places where you didn't think you would ever be. But when you get there, it's the gospel that saves you. Now, I don't know that angels are going to go out and talk to somebody and tell them to come in here and talk to this preacher. He could do that. That's God's business. But my business is when I find the person who needs the gospel to give it to them. Whether they come in here or we go out there. God can use that which is less than perfect. Absolutely. Notice what Paul said. Some to be sure are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. If the truths of the gospel are there, God can use those to save people even if some of the trappings are not what we would like. Now that's true across the board, and I, I want to make this clear because people will accuse me of saying what I'm not saying. You can sit in a liturgical church where the pastor doesn't even believe the gospel, and I know that some don't because I've talked to them, and yet read a responsive reading, sing a hymn, open a Bible, and see, a, and see something of the light of the gospel in the material that's the, the truth. Maybe you recite the Apostles' Creed that you believe that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, and one day you actually believe it. Wow. You can be converted. Now, does that mean that we should just copy the plan of the liturgical church and get a pastor who's unconverted? Because it worked for that person? No, I'm not saying that's true for all liturgical churches. <laughs> it's just some cases that has happened. You can be sitting somewhere where there's hardly any light of the gospel. But if there's some light, God can use it. So we would agree that God can use that which is less than perfect. But we would also agree that if we know what God has ordained and what God has said, what he wants us to do, that's what we should do. That we will get the best results and the best effect and that God will change the most lives through us if we are faithful to what he told us to do and not use something less than perfect because somebody else told us that it works. Now I'd apply that to the seeker movement. The seeker movement says you've got to create a church that looks appealing to the people in your target audience, which is the people out in your community. So you do marketing research, you do focus groups, and you find out who Saddleback Sam or some other composite person is out there. And having figured that out, you design a church that would be what they would want to go to. And the music, the the, the sermon, instead of from the Bible, you maybe have one verse and then some 10 steps to better living, whatever it may be, and you fill this big auditorium with people. And some of them go and read your doctrinal statement, if it's an orthodox one, and actually get saved. 
And because some people get saved in those churches, then they say, see, it works. No, I'd say, see, God is merciful. And it wasn't that person's fault that you didn't give them the gospel right straight up front. And God will still save people who reach out in faith if they get enough gospel somewhere. Maybe one of your songs had it in, although it's rare. You could probably get saved at the Crystal Cathedral. No? Okay. I went too far there. All right. <laughs> no, no, that's really radical. <laughs> well, that seems pretty remote, but uh, something might happen there. Maybe some of their hymns still have something about Christ in them. But let's look on. What does the scripture say? We need to obey God and use his means revealed in scripture. He says, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead. In other words, he's coming again to judge. And by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Now, is that clear enough? What did God tell us to do? Preach the word. When? In season and out. Anytime, any place, anywhere. If you end up out in a wilderness with an Ethiopian eunuch, preach the word. And how should we do this? Reprove, rebuke, exhort. Do people want to be rebuked? No. They don't want to be reproved. They don't exhort is to tell them what God's will is and what's right and what's wrong and what's true and what's false. And do so with great patience and instruction. Now, look, notice why. Notice why. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. See, if you if accept the premises of the seeker movement, you're never going to have sound and doctrine. Sound doctrine. You know why? Because we're in that end times that Paul prophesied when they won't endure it. And if you're going to let the audience determine the message, you're guaranteed not to preach sound doctrine. They won't endure it. Now what did Paul say? Because they won't endure it, rebuke them, reprove them, and preach it to them anyhow. It's so clear. I don't know how it could be any clearer. But what, what does it say here? But wanting to have their ears tickled, what does that mean? Tell me something that I like to hear. Why don't you preach on, I've heard this before, and go ahead and say it if you want. Why don't you preach on something positive? <laughs> so, well, uh, I think that the love of God in Christ is the most positive thing I've ever heard. I think the blood of Thomas is the most positive doctrine I've ever heard in my life. Why couldn't wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. But wanting to have their ears tickled, notice they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires. This right here is a prophecy of the seeker movement coming in the end of the age. That there would, be a rise a time, there would arise a future time in the church when the desires and priorities of the unregenerate would determine the message of the church. Dear ones, we are living in that time. And I believe this is a watershed issue. It's an either-or issue. And I know some are saying, no, 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 I still believe the real gospel and I'll preach it every once in a while, but I've got to do this church for the unchurched thing. I've got to do this. No, you don't have to do it. It doesn't say to do that. It says preach the word. Because the problem is, even if you do have the true gospel in the back door somewhere, and you get some people in a small meeting and tell them the real gospel, and a few get saved, they're going to have to come to church Sunday after Sunday and not get fed. They've got to sit in a pew and starve because you're trying to uh, tickle these ears and give people what they want to hear. It doesn't matter what sinners desire. It matters what God's ordained to save them. Amen. And this is so clear, it just totally absolutely boggles my mind that it just seems like the mass of the evangelical church can't see it. It says they will turn away their ears from truth and they'll turn aside to myths. So what, are we, what should we do? We need to stop this. We need to stand against it. We need to preach the truth, not myths. Myths can't save people. Now what did God say he would do? It says in John 16 and verse 8, and he, the Holy Spirit, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. And if we use true gospel preaching right from the Bible, God will use that to convict of sin, 
People don't think that they're sinners. That's not even a category in their mind. They just think they're suffering from lack of fulfillment in life or something like that. But God will convict. Righteousness, people don't know why they need to be right before God and what it takes to have right standing before God. And judgment, they don't really believe it. I was talking to someone last Sunday who was a fairly new Christian, and we were talking about this very issue, and he says, you know, when you're not a Christian, you just don't believe it's going to happen. You might hear a preacher saying that God's going to come and judge and that people are going to go to hell, but you don't believe it. It just does, it seems too far-fetched. But the Holy Spirit will convict you that these things are actually true. The moment I was converted, the actual moment, and down of milliseconds, if you, if you could say so, I knew that heaven was real and hell was real. I just knew it. And I knew that if I didn't repent, I'd go to hell. And, and for days before that, people were telling me about Christ, and I wouldn't listen to them. And I didn't believe it, and I thought they were just religious nuts. When you're converted, you know it's true. And the Holy Spirit does that. So what does he use? The message preached. So we should preach it. Now I'm going to <clears throat> say some things about our theology and our terminology. We all have used these terms. I have many, many times. I don't now, but for many years I did. And people have gotten saved through these means uh, that I would affirm. Maybe thousands and millions of people. But we need to learn the way of the Lord more perfectly. And I hope that we can. Now, some of our terminology that came ultimately from this Finney view was accept Jesus as your personal Savior. Now, there's some, there's some good about that, or accept Christ as your personal Savior. The reason we say personal Savior sometimes is to, to stand against this idea of just some generic salvation. I'm saved because I'm Presbyterian, or I'm saved because I'm American. And oh, yeah, and I believe Jesus is sort of this group thing. And so when we say personal, I understand that. But the problem with this accepting thing is that it creates in people's minds a role reversal. And I, without being uh, mean to anybody or their motives, I want to say, and I wrote this in an article um, that's out of print now, it's issue 73, you can get it on the website. The problem is we have created a role reversal. Here's what I see. We say, well, Jesus stands at the door and knocks. You've got to accept him. Jesus is waiting for you. And what you create in the minds of the person is that Jesus is needy and we're sitting in the power position. Maybe unintended, but that's what happens. And MacArthur has been talking about this a lot. And so um, Jesus is waiting and what, what's the sinner going to do? But the way it's portrayed in the Bible by Stephen, by Peter, by many a different people is that Jesus is the judge and we're in trouble with him. And what we ought to be worried about is what he's going to do. Is he going to forgive me or is he going to damn me? Are you, are you following me? Let's take the one in Joel. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. We've used that in evangelism for years. You're in the valley of decision, now what's your decision? Well, I went and looked it up in Joel for this article that I wrote. Wherever that is, issue 73. Here it is. This is on the website. This was in 2002. So I've been talking about this for some time. Here's the deal. I went back into Joel to see what the valley of decision was. Well, here's what it is. It's basically where Armageddon's going to happen. And the nations are brought into this valley of decision. The person who's making the decision is God. Just think about that. God's making the decision. And the idea is that you're brought into this place where Armageddon is going to happen where God is going to wipe out the wicked nations that have assembled themselves against Israel, and also the wicked in Israel who refused to repent if they put themselves on that side of it. Uh, and God has gone into his chambers to consider the verdict. And when he comes out, his decision will be made. And when he makes the decision, if you're not right with God, you're condemned for eternity. And so the reason we talk about the problem of decision theology is that we've got the wrong person making the decision. Now, if you're thinking God is in his chambers and he's got my case in front of him and he's going to come out, um, I have never been... No, that's right. I was, uh, I, I was going to say I've never been brought to court on charges, but I, that's wrong. When I was 19, I got a speeding ticket. And it wasn't fair. <laughs> but anyhow, I had to go... <laughs> 
I had to go sit, and the mayor was the judge in a little town of Sheldon. I had to go sit out there, and the door was open, and somebody was in there before me. And the, and the mayor was saying, then this person brought a lawyer in, because she was a young lady who had gotten a reckless driving ticket because somebody got in the trunk of her car, and she drove around the block. <laughs> and, and, and the mayor says, I don't care about lawyers or anything else. If the police gave them a ticket, they're guilty. That's all I need to know. <laughs> and I was sitting there thinking I was going to plead my case. <laughs> so I went in and said, all right. <laughs> and I had to pay my 35 bucks. He said, all right, you're right with society now. Go your way. So I did have to go before the judge. But what if you had to go before the judge for a serious criminal charge? And all the evidence was brought in, and you are guilty, and the judge has gone back into his chambers, and when he comes out, he's going to issue the verdict. What would you feel like? You would be horrified. You would be terrified. This would be the worst day of your entire life because you're thinking, I may end up in jail the rest of my life. Some terrible, I'll, I'll never escape. He's going to come back and find me guilty. That's the picture in Joel. It's not God sitting here waiting for the sinner to judge him. It's not us deciding, is God good enough for me? Or what is it, the Doobie Brothers, Jesus is just okay with me? No, 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 no. We have to take the gravity of the situation to heart and realize, I don't want to be sitting here. I don't want to be the defendant. I don't want the evidence going before the judge. I know what his verdict's going to be, and I'm going to go to hell. And when you know that, the valley of decision is the best place to be because you'll flee to a Savior. You flee to the Savior because of your fear of God making a decision. Do we accept Christ? Well, that's exactly what I said. When I got saved, I went to the guys I was working with who I heard me blaspheming Christ the day before, and I told them I accepted Christ. That's how it seems to work to us. It's not a terminology we find in the Bible. I think it's better to believe, say that I believed in Christ. It's more biblical. Many people have accepted Christ and been saved, but I think we should think about our, it's not for us to decide whether we accept or reject him, it's whether he's going to accept or reject us and on what terms, and it should be because of, what, of the gospel. Then we say make a decision for Jesus. But then the problem with decisionism is that it's very much like Finney, assuming that the unsaved person has this island of righteousness or this moral power, this dormant, that somehow can be excited into just making this decision. Uh, the fact is, if you do make, I, let me explain this. When it comes to the universal call, it can be explained as a decision. MacArthur does it all the time. It definitely can. I heard MacArthur preaching a sermon on angels, and he told about how angels, what angels do and how they serve God's people and different things they've done in the Bible. And then at the end of the sermon, MacArthur says, now you've got a decision to make. And the decision concerns which role you want the angels to have in your life. And he quoted the scripture about how the angels will come and take all the wicked out of the kingdom and throw them into the fire. So he says, either the angels will be ministering servants, caring for you until you get to glory, or they're waiting on the sidelines for God to give the final verdict, and then they're going to come, and they're going to carry you off and throw you into hell. So you decide which version of angels you want. I listen to that sermon and go, wow, that's strong. Now why is he portraying it as a decision? Because MacArthur thinks they have the power innately to do it? No, this is part of the universal call. It's just like the command to repent. And if it's a command to repent, God uses that. He can, God can convict somebody. Somebody may be sitting there in MacArthur's church hearing that sermon about angels and get scared to death. And realize, I better get right with God. I don't want to wait for the angels to carry me away. Ask Jesus into your heart. Now, that comes from that thing in Revelation that we know is about the church and is, really isn't biblical terminology. People have done this and they've been saved. But why were they saved? Not because they said the words, I asked Jesus into my heart. It's because they believed the gospel. And I'm just saying, why don't we get our terminology more reflective of the scripture? This one is really bad. Come to Jesus and find happiness and purpose. Jesus is uh, what Ray Comfort called life enhancement preaching. Come to Jesus and everything will be fine. We don't even know that to be true. Come to Jesus and your family may kick you out and never talk to you again. Huh? That happens. Let's go on. 
Biblical terminology. It's really quite simple. And it's throughout the Bible. Repent and believe the gospel. Jesus said that. Repent and believe the gospel. Jesus said, I have not come to call righteous, but sinners to repentance. I have people email me all the time saying that I teach salvation by works because I preach repentance. They can't get it. Jesus calls sinners to repentance. I don't, I don't understand how they get these goofy theologies that, that are so obviously not biblical. Look at what Jesus said in Luke 24, 47. Uh, that repentance for forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. Well, who are the nations? They're not the church, are they? It's sinners. We preach for, uh, repentance to people that are lost. Paul tells us what he preached, solemnly testifying to both J Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you've been in this church for long, you've heard me preach it week after week after week. Turn from trusting man, turn from trusting self, turn from trusting religion, turn from whatever it is that you're living for, and turn to God and serve him on his terms through grace by faith. Very straightforward. God will use that. Some people ask this. Why command people to repent unless they have the natural ability to do so? That's what Finney says. If people don't already have the ability, why preach something they can't do? Good question. Well, because it's part of the universal call that God uses to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment, and he will use that to awaken people as the Holy Spirit penetrates into their hardened hearts and makes them alive. Notice what Paul said to Timothy, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth. I preach repentance because I believe God may indeed grant repentance. And when he does, what a glorious day it is. A new soul is born into the kingdom of God. Notice Paul's preaching the universal call in Acts 17, 30 to 31. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent. Absolutely. Why? Because it's God's moral will. Why preach God's moral will if people don't have moral ability? Because God is holy and he can, say, he can teach nothing less than what's perfectly holy. God can teach nothing less than what is good and what is moral and what is upright and what is true. But it doesn't imply that sinners are the, have the ability to make themselves perfectly moral just by trying harder. It shows us our need for the gospel, the law and the gospel. So to command to repent is part of gospel preaching that brings the law of God to bear and to show us our need to change. Notice what Paul says. Now we need to distinguish between a universal call that everybody hears as it goes out through the preachers and the internal call that is heard internally to those who are converted. And he says this in Romans 9, 23 and 24, and he did so to make the known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he has called. So notice that there is one use of the term call, call sinners to repentance, which is universal, and another use of the word call that applies only to those who actually believe. None of us know who those will be in the future. Would you agree with me? If you, and I think we'd all have to agree, if there's a hundred people here and the street preacher is preaching to all a hundred of them, no one could predict which one of those persons will hear this internal call, come and cry out to God. My brother-in-law did. The street preacher, before, before he was my brother-in-law, the street preacher came and this guy was a skinny little Pentecostal preacher. And he went down to the dance hall where they were having a rock and roll dance and the teenagers were streaming out of there, including my brother-in-law. And they stood around, and he started preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. And they mocked him and ridiculed him, made fun of him, hissed and made rude, vulgar comments. And Jim looked at all his buddies doing this, and he thought, why are they treating this guy like this? He's just trying to tell us what he believes. And he went, and, and, and Jim got saved. <laughs> Is that it? He dropped to his knees right there. Amen. Jesus Christ. 
And God eventually saved our whole family, Diane, her dad, and ultimately the worst one, me, uh, Diane's fiance. Now, why did Jim drop to his knees and meet Jesus out there while all of his mocking buddies thought he was nuts? Not because he's morally superior to all those guys, because he heard the call. He heard the Lord call his name. And you and I don't know who's going to hear that. And so we need to put it out there. But imagine another scenario. Say that little preacher telling them about Christ and the blood and the need to repent. What if he went out and said, we're going to have a rock and roll church service for you all. And we got a better rock band in our church than what you just heard in here. Do you think they'd ridicule him? Absolutely not. They'd go to church. You're not going to get rejected for inviting sinners to have what they already would like. So the called, we don't know who they are, so we better get the gospel out so God will save them. It says in 2 Timothy 1.9, he called us with a holy calling, not according to our works. That's the effectual call. Here's some essential gospel truths as I need to draw to a close here. The unique person of Christ. People need to know who Jesus is. We can't assume they know. They don't know he pre-existed as God, then they just think he's a man. We need to know the reason for his death on the cross. It should be proclaimed because they don't know why. Everybody's heard Jesus died on the cross for the most part of their America. There's crosses everywhere. But they don't know why. It was because of God's wrath against their sin. If you don't tell them, they won't know why. The blood atonement, rarely preached, but it's throughout the New Testament as the essential doctrine, and Paul said that he preached that. The resurrection, only Jesus was bodily raised from the dead. Coming judgment. People need to know it's real. God is going to come and judge this benevolent empire is bunkum. We're not going to create a millennium. We're not going to solve the world's problems. We're not going to feed everybody. We can feed anybody as, as God enables us. We should do alms. But the idea that we're going to create some Christianized paradise on planet Earth by Christian action is false. It'll, it'll be dashed just as badly as the one they tried to do in the 19th century was dashed by the 20th century. He's coming in judgment, so we better be ready to meet him. There's a big chasm between these two approaches I've outlined before you this morning. Either there's some innate human ability, dormant moral powers, some, something good in man that can be appealed to, which can be excited by the right message, or all sinners are spiritually dead, unable and disinclined to obey God unless God does a supernatural work of grace. I believe the second is true, that that's true. So we should preach it the way it is. Chasm, either or. If human ability is true, then Finney and his many evangelical followers are right. We should find out what will excite sinners into action and do that. But if he's false and wrong, we should preach the gospel in this native offense and trust God to use it to save whoever will be saved. I'm going to close by showing that Finney has a 21st century counterpart who's doing almost the same thing Finney did. Let me quote Finney's great, great, great grandson spiritually. It is my deep conviction that anybody can be one to Christ if you discover the key to his or her heart. Now, if you believe that, what are you going to study? Man, you're going to study people to figure out what's in them so you can find that little key, that island of righteousness, that, that, that uh, dormant moral power to excite into action. That's Finney all over again. Why do we not discern this? Because we accepted Finney in the 19th century. Why shouldn't we accept this new version today? It may take some, some, some time to identify it, but the most likely place to start is with the person's felt needs. Rick Warren, Purpose Driven Church. Well, that's exactly what Paul warned against in 2 Timothy 4. Having your ears tickled. It doesn't matter what they feel they need. Does any sinner feel like they need the blood of Jesus? Not unless they've been convicted of their sin. Finney wanted to create a millennium and a golden age of Christianity, a benevolent empire in the world by motivating Christians to take action. 
Warren wants to institute his peace plan to solve the world's biggest problems by motivating Christians to take action. Let me quote somebody that doesn't agree, John MacArthur. If our gospel is veiled to someone, it is veiled because that person, like all sinners, is unable to understand. Changing the message, manipulating the emotions, or the will is useless, since no one can believe unless God grants him understanding. I want to commend two books to you for further study. Hard to Believe by John MacArthur and The Gospel According to the Apostles by John MacArthur. MacArthur, Ray Comfort, a guy named Mark Keeler from Cross TV, there's a few of us who are taking a stand on this. And we are proclaiming that we've gotten it wrong from Finney on. Let's get back to what God said. Let's get back to the kind of preaching that they had in the New Testament. And let's get back to the blood atonement, repentance, and faith, and the basics of Christian doctrine so that people can be saved. And let's lay aside this notion that somehow man has some inner ability that we can so somehow appeal to without a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for your patience uh, as I was able to get this to you. Thank you.